Greetings everybody and welcome again to my series on probability and statistics. Once again I am Dr. Lathram and you can find me in the Department of Mathematics at Missouri Southern State University. So let's get started today on our lecture on sample spaces, conditional probability, and Bayes theorem. So the beginnings of probability theory have to do with the notion of an experiment. And by an experiment, we mean a process by which an observation is made. Typically, this may be some kind of numerical value. Um, it may be something as simple as um, watching certain signals go by in an experiment. Um, it could be looking at a string of letters that go across the page as we are reading them. So we can think of that as really being an experiment and we're making observations in this experiment. The sample space associated with an experiment is the set consisting of all possible outcomes for the experiment. Now when we say all possible outcomes, we're thinking more in the theoretical sense rather than going into the laboratory and, and making measurements. So we develop this kind of theoretical model of how we think something is working and from that we will deduce well, what, what outcomes are possible from that. Um, when we go into the laboratory, now we're doing statistical measurements on things. So we may not get every single outcome in the laboratory um, in one small setting that we would get um, that could be possible theoretically. And so we're making that distinction now that, that we're dealing in the theoretical realm where we have all possible outcomes. So an event inside this sample space is going to be a subset of the sample space. So just an event is really something that a set of outcomes that can happen. Typically we we'll usually denote the sample space by the variable s. So our probabilities are going to be functions that are defined on the a, set, a collection of subsets of the sample space, so a collection of events. And this collection of subsets has certain properties to it, properties that mathematically we call um, an algebra. Now what those properties are, so if we have a sample space S, an algebra of sets is going to be a collection of subsets, script F, such that the empty set is going to be contained in this description. If A and B are elements, so if we've got two events that can happen, then it's possible to say that either A happens or B happens, so that the union of two of them is also an outcome. And finally, if an event happens, then we also want it possible for the event not to happen. So if A is an element of the collection, then the complement, A bar, is also an element of the collection. For our discrete or countable sample spaces, um, the algebra will always take our algebra to be the power set. So the set of all possible subspaces of the sample space. When we move into continuous distributions, now our events will be, our kind of generating set will be the open and closed intervals. And so formally our algebra will be called um, the collection of Borel sets. Now that may be a little bit beyond um, the scope of what we're talking about. You probably encounter that more in a description of um, analysis or advanced calculus class, somewhere in there. Um, so we won't too worry too much about the exact details of that, but it's good to introduce the terminology just so you can, if it happens to come up later. So let's talk about some axioms we would like to have for our probability functions. So again, we start with an experiment, and that experiment is going to have a sample space associated with it. And to every event, um, a, we assign some number p of a, um, p of a with the square bracket, sometimes you see it written as prob a, so the probability of the event a. Um, and this function, um, probability, is going to have certain properties that we would like. The first 
is going to be that the probability of any event is always going to be between 0 and 1 inclusive. So probabilities will never be negative numbers, probabilities will never be greater than 1. Um, that's our first axiom. Second axiom is the probability of the sample space will be 1. So if we stop to think that the an, uh, an event is really a possible outcome. So what we're saying is if we run this experiment the probability that something happens so that some event occurs um, will be absolutely certain to happen. That, so that gives us a probability of 1. So the probability of the sample space of something happening is 1. And then if we have two events A and B, and suppose that the intersection of those two events is empty. We say that A and B are mutually exclusive. And so if we have two mutually exclusive events, then the probability that either A happens or B happens will be the sum that the probability of A happens plus the probability that B happens. So that gives us kind of, that is really going to narrowing down a little bit on um, what types of functions can actually show up for our probability distributions. Now let's look at the relationship between an event in an experiment and its complement. So if P is a probability function for an experiment and A is going to be an event in the experiment, then the probability of the event not occurring is equal to 1 minus the probability of the event occurring. Let's see if we can demonstrate this from our axioms of probability. So we begin by seeing that higher sample space S for the experiment can be written as A union the complement of A. So that gives us the entire space so that either the event occurs or the event doesn't occur. That's the only possibilities that can happen. So we have the entire sample space is the union. Now axiom 2 in our probabilities says that the probability of the sample space is going to be 1. But that means that the probability of A union A bar is 1. Now A and A bar are mutually are disjoint. Okay, so they have the intersection is empty. So they are mutually exclusive events. They both can't happen at the same time. It's not possible for an event to happen and not happen at the same time. So our axiom three of probability says that the probability of the union of those two things is going to be equal to the pro sum of the probabilities of the individual outcomes. So that gives us the probability of A plus the probability of A bar. So if we just do a little bit of rearranging, so we move the probability of A to the other side and we get the probability that in an event doesn't happen is actually equal to 1 minus the probability that the event does happen. So now let's look at the probability of the union of two events. So the probability of the union of two events, so now A and B don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive, is going to be equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of the intersection. So the probability that both events occur simultaneously. Let's see if we can prove that from our axioms of probability. So we begin by writing A union B as the union of three disjoint sets. So we have A intersect the complement of B, A intersect B, and A complement intersect B. So if you're not convinced of that, um, take a look at the Venn diagrams of that set breakdown and, and see if you can convince yourself that that's going to be true. So by the third axiom of probability, if we've got the A union B written as the disjoint union of three sets, then that disjoint union, then the probability of that is going to be the sum of the probabilities. So that's our axiom three. But we also have that A 
is going to be A intersect the complement of B union A intersect B. Likewise for B, B is going to be A the complement of A intersect B union A intersect B. So again, stare at some Venn diagrams to convince yourself that that's going to be true. And so the probability of A is going to be the probability of A intersect B complement plus the probability of A intersect B. Same thing for the probability of B. And so kind of doing some algebra in here. Probability of A union B complement. We can replace that with the probability of A minus the probability of the intersection. We have the probability of the intersection plus the probability of A complement union B is replaced with the probability of B minus the probability of the intersection. So if we put those together, then one of our probabilities of the intersection cancels out and we get our desired conclusion. So let's look at a problem where we can put some of these um, notions to use. So suppose we've got an insurance company that's examining a pool of auto insurance customers and we have the following information. First, that all customers insure at least one car. 70% of the customers insure more than one car. 20.5% of the customers insure only a non-sports car. And 10.5% of the customers who insure multiple cars also insure a sports car. So the question we would like to know is what percentage of customers insure only a sports car? So we begin by defining two sets. So one set M, I'm going to call the set of customers who insure multiple cars. S is going to be not the sample space in this case. S is going to be the set of customers who insure a sports car. And so probably the best way of describing this particular setting is using a Venn diagram. So we've got two circles, one for M, one for S, and then we've got an, an intersection that we have here. So now from the information that we were given, 70% of the customers insure multiple cars. So M are the people who are insuring multiple cars. So the probability of M is going to be 0.7. So I shaded that set here to let you know which one we're actually talking about. We know that 20.5% um, are insuring only a single non-sports car. Okay. The proportion of people who insure multiple cars of the multiple cars, one of them is going to be a sports car. That's going to correspond to the intersection of the two sets and that proportion is going to be 0 0.105. And so what we want to know is what's the probability that a customer insures only a sports car? So they're in the set S, um, so this notation is for the set difference. So I'm in S but I'm not in M, so the percentage of probability that a customer is insuring a sports car as their only car. So let's see how we can calculate that. Well, the probability of M, so from our Venn diagram, the probability of M is going to be the probability of M set difference with S, so this area here outside the intersection, plus the probability of the intersection. Those two sets are mutually disjoint and mutually exclusive, and so the probability is going to be the sum of those, which means we can find the percentage of people in this area here that are inside M but outside the intersection. So that gives us 0 0.5095. Now the probability of our entire sample space is going to be 1, 
but we can break this up into mutually disjoint regions. So we've got the probability of the complement, so everything outside those two circles, probability of um, M union S complement. Then we have, that's going to be the probability of M set M minus S, so that's this area here, plus the probability of the intersection, and then the probability of S minus M, so the region that we actually want to know about. So if we plug in the numbers that we know now, we've got 1 is going to be equal to 0.205, plus 0 0.595, plus 0 0.105, plus the probability of the region that we want to know about. So if we just move terms around a little bit, we end up with the probability that um, a person insures only one sports car is 0 0.095. Conditional probability is another one of those concepts that's pretty useful and comes up in a variety of situations. So the conditional probability of an event A, given that an event B has already occurred, is going to be equal to, or going to be defined as, the probability of A given B, so that little vertical bar there, is going to correspond to given. So the probability of A given B is equal to the probability that A and B occur simultaneously divided by the probability that B occurs. So sometimes we see this written, we just move the probability of B over that the probability of A intersect B is going to be equal to the probability of A given B times the probability of B. So again, this is assuming, since we're making our definition with the probability of B in the denominator, we're assuming that the probability of B is going to be greater than zero. So let's look at one of the prime cases where one of the probably first beginning cases that you're going to encounter where conditional probabilities show up. And that's with sampling something without replacement. So here we're going to do an experiment in which we have five red balls and three green balls in an urn. And we're going to draw out two of those balls without replacement. So without replacement means we reach in, we grab one particular ball, we look and see what color it is, then we throw that ball away, and then we reach in and grab another ball. So because we're drawing with without replacement, then the probability of drawing the second ball really depends on the what we drew the first time, because the state of the urn is going to be different. Now if we drew that ball, looked and see what color it was, threw it back in the urn, now the second draw looks exactly like the first draw. But because we are throwing that first ball away, we're sampling without replacement, our probabilities on the second draw look slightly different. And so the sample space for this experiment will write as either first we draw a red one, then we draw another red one. First we draw a red one, then we draw a green one. We draw a green one, then we draw a red one. Or we draw a green one, then we draw another green one. So let's define variables or outcomes. And those outcomes, let's say that x is going to be the value that we get on the first draw, and y is going to be the value that we get on the second draw. Now one of the best ways that we have to analyze this kind of experiment is really using a tree diagram. Now a tree diagram kind of if you had to describe it probably looks more like a root system of a tree that we actually have this node up here which is called the root node and then our tree is just going to grow down usually that's how it's drawn doesn't have to be drawn that way but typically that's how we see it and so that's kind of the zeroth level each level in the tree corresponds to in this case um, a draw that we're doing so the first level is going to correspond to the outcomes from the first draw either red or green and then the next level is going to correspond to outcomes for the second one so <coughs> we can draw a red one or a green one red one or a green one and so as we are visualizing this we draw the red 
we draw a red one on the first one, and then on the first draw, and then after we draw the red one, then we draw a green one as one possible outcome. So that the probability of drawing a red one on the first draw, drawing a green one on the second draw, is actually going to be the probability. Now, the branches are going to be labeled by particular probabilities, and really labeled by conditional probabilities. So the first branch, this one is going to be the probability that we get a red on the first draw. This one, probability that we get a green on the first draw. Now, let's suppose that we draw a red one on the first draw. So we are standing here. This is the current state of our experiment. So we've drawn a red ball. Well, what can happen from there? Now, these will be the conditional probabilities. Conditional probabilities given that we have already drawn a red ball, because this is the node that we're standing on. So we've already drawn one red ball, then we look at the probability of drawing another red ball given that we've drawn a red ball. Or if we take this path from here down to there, now we're saying that what's the probability of drawing a green ball given that we've already drawn a red ball. Same thing over here. If we first draw a green ball, that means that our experiment is standing right here on that node. Now, if we then traverse this path, we're saying, well, what's the probability that we're drawing a green ball on the second draw whenever we've already drawn a green ball on the first draw? And from our definitions of conditional probability, it works that the outcome of drawing a green one and a green one is going to be equal to the product of first drawing a green one and then the conditional probability of drawing a green one given that we've already drawn a green one. And that's going to be true of trees in general. So sometimes you hear um, a discussion of a path through a tree. Well a path through a tree is going to be um, traversing from the top node, from the root node, down to whatever the lowest level is in the graph. The probability of that particular path is going to be the product of the probabilities along that path. Now that's just going to be each one from one node to another is going to be a conditional probability that you have gone down that path um, to actually get to that node. And so because of our definition of conditional probability, um, it works out that it will just be the product of all of the conditional probabilities along that particular path. Alright, so let's look at our experiment and say, oh, maybe we're interested in what's the probability that we draw a red one on the second draw? Well, if we look at the tree diagram for that particular outcome, um, we have two separate paths that will actually lead to getting a red ball on the second draw. So whether we get a red ball and we get another red ball, or whether we get a green ball and then we get a red ball. So how do we calculate that? Well, each path kind of looks like it is a disjoint set. And so the probability of the first path, so in and of themselves, that's going to be the union, so the probability of this event getting a red ball on the second outcome is going to be a disjoint union of getting first a red ball and then a red ball or getting a red ball on the second draw and a green ball on the first draw. So because those two are disjoint then we can then the probability of that is going to be the sum of the probabilities. So the probability of getting a red ball on the, on the second draw, a red ball on the first draw, plus the probability of getting a red ball on the second draw and a green ball on the first draw. And so now going back to our conditional probabilities, this will be the probability of getting a red ball given that we've drawn a red ball times the probability of drawing a red ball 
plus the probability of getting a red ball given that we've drawn a green ball times the probability of drawing a green ball on the first draw. And so if we put the numbers in there in each one of these cases, then this is going to give us a probability of getting a red ball on the second draw of 35 out of 56. So this, these ideas of conditional probability lead us to something called the law of total probability. So let's say that we start with a sample space for an experiment and suppose that we write that sample space as a union of events, but a union of events where the probability of any particular event is going to be non-negative. Okay, so it's going to be, or it's actually going to be positive. Okay. The events themselves are pairwise mutually exclusive. That means if you take any two of those and look at the intersection, the intersection is going to be empty. And if we've got any other experiment uh, or any other outcome for this particular experiment, so for any event A, the probability of A is going to be equal to the sum of overall from 1 up to K of the probability of A given that B sub I has occurred times the probability that B sub I occurs. So this kind of gives us um, this gives us an interesting way of looking at the probability of any particular event in terms of some subsets of events that end up spanning our entire sample space. So let's look at the proof of the law of total probability. Now A is going to be a subset of the sample space and so what we have by our distributive laws is that we can distribute that intersection across all of those unions and so that we have A intersect B sub 1, union A intersect B sub 2, and so on. But because the pairwise intersections of the B's were empty, then because A intersect B sub I is going to be a subset of B sub I, then these pairwise intersections of these sets are also going to be empty. And so that means from our third axiom of probability that this probability of this union of mutually exclusive sets is going to be the sum of the probabilities of the individual sets. And so we look at the probability of A intersect B1 and so we have that. But from our definition of conditional probability, kind of rearranging terms a little bit, we have the probability of A intersect B sub I is going to be the probability that um, A happens given that B sub I has already happened times the probability that B sub I happens. And so if we just make that replacement from our definition of conditional probability, we get our desired conclusion for the law of total probability. So one corollary to the law of total probability is something called Bayes' theorem. So in Bayes' theorem, we have a sample space that's divided up into pairwise mutually exclusive events, and the probability of each one of those events is going to be positive. Then the probability of one of those events given an event A is going to be equal to the probability of the event happening times the probability of A given the event B sub J and that's going to be divided by sum of the probability of A given B sub I times the probability of I summed over all I from 1 to K. Now let's for the proof of that we start off with two events just A and B. So the probability of A given B is going to be the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of B. So if we move the probability of B to the other side we have this expression. But then by symmetry if we start off with the probability of B given A then rearrange that we end up with two different expressions for the probability of the intersection. So if we equate those two probabilities, we end up with this kind of expression of which now kind of dropping out the probability of A intersect B from the middle 
<coughs> dividing by the probability of A, and we have the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A given B times the probability of B divided by the probability of A. Now, where we institute the law of total probability. So we write the probability of A as the sum over those conditional probabilities. And if we make this substitution, the law of total probability, into the probability of A, we obtain our desired conclusion. All right, let's do a quick application of Bayes' theorem. So let's suppose that we've got two urns, urn one and urn two. Inside those urns, though in urn one, we've got seven red balls and four black balls. In urn two, we have five red and eight black. So the game is this. We're gonna flip a fair coin to choose an urn, and then we're gonna draw one ball from the urn. So here's the question. A red ball is drawn. What is the probability that it came from urn 1? So we can write the probability of drawing a red ball as a probability of drawing a red ball from urn 1 times the probability of being in urn 1 plus the probability of drawing a red ball from urn 2 given times the probability of being in urn 2. So if we put those numbers in, so 7 out of 11 in urn 1 are red. And, um, it's a fair coin, so the probability of being in urn 1 is a half. We have 5 red balls out of 13 balls in urn 2. Again, probability of ending up in urn 2 is 1 half, so that gives us a probability of a red ball being 73 over 143. So in this case, we've used the law of total probability to give us the probability of getting a red ball. Then we come down and use Bayes' theorem. Well, according to Bayes' theorem, the probability of being in urn 1, given that we've gotten a red ball, is going to be the probability of a red ball given in, that we're in urn 1 times the probability of urn 1 divided by the total probability of getting a red ball. And so when we plug in our numbers, we get 7 over 11 times 1 half divided by 73 over 143, which gives us 91 over 146, or approximately 0.623, as being the probability of being in urn 1. So kind of what Bayes' theorem lets you do, it maybe lets you based on observation, kind of backtrack to get information about the problem that maybe you didn't have before. That's kind of one application of Bayes' theorem. So that's a pretty good overview of kind of the beginnings of probability, and uh, let's call it good for now. Talk to you guys later.